thank you very much. Uh, so yeah, I will be talking about securely scaling decentralized governance, which means I'm probably going to have to define uh, that large uh, word sandwich of a title. Um, so really quickly about me, uh, I've been working with blockchain technology for uh, 10 plus years, started with Bitcoin in 2012, began with Ethereum in 2017, um, and then joined Open Zeppelin, and now I do a lot of work with the Compound DAO and also some public policy work, which is to say I work with a lot of legacy governance. Um, so the mission for Open Zeppelin, we've been doing, I'm sure, a lot of work that you're familiar with, with our contract library, our security audits, and then also uh, security tooling like Defender. Um, and we're kind of really trying to figure out like, how are we going to achieve security while keeping economies open and uh, decentralized. Um, and that's most uh, definitely a problem with DAOs. Um, so when I say decentralized governance, what I really mean is uh, everyone in a community is getting a fair, equitable voice in protocol decision making, um, which is easier said than done. Um, but it's especially hard to say when you are trying to achieve things at scale. Um, so when you're trying to make more decisions, more complex decisions on a more frequent basis, um, and this tends to hit a limit where eventually you're having to compromise on either the security of the system for how you make decisions or the decentralization, which is to say you're centralizing decision making. Um, and so in a lot of ways, this kind of mirrors the scalability trilemma that we're familiar with in the Ethereum space of like trying to scale throughput for a blockchain itself. So with on-chain governance having exploded and a lot of people now talking about it or using it to manage billion dollar protocols, uh, we really have to examine this problem and consider what are the strategies we need to address it. Um, so first, let's just define it. What do we mean by decentralized governance? Because there's actually many different forms that we could be talking about. Um, first, let's talk about implicit versus explicit governance. Uh, implicit governance uh, is what I would say defines any decisions made off-chain using social coordination, um, typically through some sort of a, client's, a client update. So, for example, the way that Ethereum makes decisions for uh, the merge, that's almost entirely off-chain. There is uh, core dev meetings, there's an EIP process, and then eventually that reaches a stage after many tests and discussions and community review that the community have effectively reached social consensus and decided we're going to make this upgrade at said date uh, and then update our reference clients accordingly. Um, and then there's explicit governance, which is to say, instead of doing all of that off-chain and then, you know, there's just a code switch that happens where we've kind of all reached consensus, uh, explicit governance is encoded on-chain. And the reason that's nice is, you know, the social coordination game can be very, like, complex. You want to make sure that we've all, like, reached consensus uh, before you do an upgrade or you might have a fork, especially when it comes to layer one blockchains. And that can be contentious and cause a lot of issues and confusion. So, um, but that means that decisions usually take a long time and can maybe take years. And so you might want to do that for things like, you know, changing your consensus algorithm, but maybe not for like how you allocate grants or how you, uh, you know, patch small bugs or other things like that. So explicit governance takes these decisions and puts them on chain so that something like a DAO can actually make an on-chain decision and then on-chain execute that decision. Uh, so, you know, this is now being used by DAOs to do protocol treasury management, doing upgrades for improvements and bug fixes, and then, you know, parameter changes for things like DeFi markets, interest rates, et cetera. Uh, and a lot of these on-chain decision makers may collectively be called a DAO, but we should break this down a bit more and talk about what we are actually saying when we say a DAO or on-chain governance. Um, the first thing is kind of an obvious one. It's like an admin account. Someone has owner privileges. Uh, you can use the ownable contracts library from Open Zeppelin, and, you know, have the ability to call certain functions as a privileged account. And, you know, this is essentially kind of the, the one-man dictatorship or one-key dictatorship where it can make a lot of unilateral decisions. Uh, but maybe you want to break this up a bit and you want to make it a multi-sig. So maybe four out of seven or two out of three uh, accounts can make decisions uh, for the protocol that are privileged. Uh, and then maybe we go a bit further. Before that multi-sig makes a decision, we put it to a vote uh, based on token holders or based on, like, maybe, you know, NFTs. And uh, they can vote off-chain using Snapshot, for example. Um, and that basically will give the uh, way to verifiably authenticate what the community wants, uh, you know, the multi-sig to do, and then the multi-sig will then do it. But it's not binding. Uh, in that sense, it's almost implicit. Um, so you can almost call it implicit on its own. But then we talk about governor contracts. And this is like, okay, the, the full DAO. It has the voting on chain, and then the decision's ratified on chain, and then it's executed on chain. The whole thing's linked together. Uh, so this is kind of like the ultimate DAO that a lot of people talk about, most famously with Compound Governor Bravo. So if we look at that process for the governor, uh, the Compound Governor DAO, it starts with proposal creation, where you have a two-day review, so people can take a look, figure out what it is. Uh, a three-day vote, where people can submit votes based on their tokens, in this case, comp tokens. Uh, you have to reach a minimum quorum of about 400,000 comp tokens, um, but you, know, you can set it to be whatever you want with like Open Zeppelin Governor. 
Um, and then the voting ends and you've either succeeded or failed, and then you might have a time lock as well uh, that then will take two days to execute it so people can you know, have time to look at it uh, before it is going to happen in case maybe they want to pull their money out or they just, they just disagree with it. Um, so it seems simple, it seems straightforward, but there's actually a lot of complexity that comes out when you're trying to do standard operations through this model. Uh, so let's talk about those pain points. What are, uh, how, why is decentralized governance proving to be so hard and how are uh, maybe a few foot guns are developing? So first of all, the security of upgrades is uh, a really important component of this because uh, you know, upgrade patterns have become more and more common for smart contracts where you are able to actually modify the logic of that smart contract. Uh, you can you know, preserve the state and keep that same address. Uh, and this is often done for good reasons, to add features, to fix bugs, um, you know, to avoid costly migrations. But it's also very powerful. It can break immutability guarantees uh, and if it is controlled by governance that isn't properly secured, it can be an attack vector for your protocol, or it can just simply be a way to introduce bugs that you know, might not have been there before, but after an upgrade suddenly cause issues. Um, so even minor upgrades from third-party contributors, and there's many examples of DAOs being upgraded and then having issues that come out, um, you know, means you know, anyone could submit a proposal to your DAO, and then uh, that might have a bug in it, it might not have been properly vetted, uh, and that can undermine protocol security. And that presents a challenge for DAOs that want to regularly you know, get security audits, get reviews, um, when anyone can just submit one, and then you, know, you have like maybe two days to review it, and then it gets voted on. Um, so there has to be a lot more awareness for how you're actually going to do upgrades and how you're verifying they're secure. Um, one example is we actually found a token that was listed on Compound earlier this year called TrueUSD um, that had a double entry point. There were two addresses through which you could call it, and that basically created an a issue where you could have actually um, uh, uh, kind of broken an $80 million marketplace. It wasn't very good. Um, luckily, upgradability actually fixed that issue because the TrueUSD team upgraded their contracts um, and removed the entry point, and so uh, no, no funds were lost, no issues occurred. But you also have to consider the fact that, well, if they can... Uh, fix bugs, they can also introduce bugs. So you have to think about this not just from the perspective of your system and how you upgrade it, but if you're like listing ERC-20 tokens or you're integrating with third-party protocols, uh, you have to consider the fact that if they're upgradable, then they might be able to introduce bugs in the future that affect your system. Um, so you have to think of governance uh, from an ecosystem perspective, not just your own silo. Uh, and then also, there's operational overhead and accountability. So like taking that same problem, how do you review security, how do you do upgrades, um, that, that goes further, not just like doing operational needs around like, you know, security reviews, but also like treasury management, budget approval, uh, how you're going to do technical development and deployments, how you're going to shepherd the protocol vision and roadmap, how are you going to define the direction for this DAO that we've all created or the protocol that it's managing. Um, and in many cases, this is being done at like a voting level where just people have tokens and they can vote. Um, but it's not necessarily clear who has specific responsibilities from the DAO's perspective. There are sometimes community leaders, but they're not given any explicit uh, authority outside of maybe delegates, because you can, you know, in a lot of cases, delegate voting power. Um, but that can create voter apathy. It can be very difficult for people to keep up to date with DAO's forums. Um, is anyone here in a DAO forum, by the way? All right, a few people. But... But you know, I know a few people that basically like you know they, they get into a DAO for two weeks and then after that two weeks they get burned out because trying to keep up with it is very difficult. So that decision making as it becomes more frequent and complex, the accountability of those delegates as well as like the voting apathy can increase, and you have to be really careful about that not turning into an issue. Uh, and then finally, governance attacks, which is basically to say that your governance itself could be an attack vector if someone's able to manipulate it to do something like take all the money. Um, so an example of this was with uh, Beanstalk. Uh, so, you know, you know, governance systems can suffer flaws, and in the case of Beanstalk, they suffered a loss of $77 million when an attacker was able to submit a uh, proposal that basically just gave him all the money. Um, and uh, that proposal was submitted over the weekend. It only had a one-day review process, and then once uh, that review process was hit, it normally goes through a seven-day vote, but they had a clause that said if you reach a two-thirds supermajority, um, then you can just execute it immediately, because surely if two-thirds of the community has voted on it, then you know, we've reached consensus, and why wait? Um, well, the problem is what happens if they used a flash loan to borrow that two-thirds of the token supply, and then voted it through, and then basically took all the money. Um, so technically, they followed the rules of the protocol. They, they took a vote, and then they, it was approved, but uh, clearly not what, what was intended, and that's clearly an attack vector that we have to be very careful about. So when, with you know, the value, uh, under control of DAO is increasing, we have to be kind of careful with these activist takeovers where people can use the systems of DeFi to uh, attack your protocol through flash loans or other means. So, lots of scary things, but how do we uh, respond to this? How do we build DAOs so that we're not just getting lucky 
with avoiding governance threats, but we're actually building a DAO or building a protocol to have governance that is resilient and resistant to this, just like we try to build permissionless systems to automatically be resistant to things like you know, uh, network attacks. Um, well, one is just simply building safety limits on governance, you know, kind of the checks and balances that we're familiar with in normal governance, like, uh, you know, in, you know, the, the, the three branches of government within the U.S., for example. Um, so when you're doing on-chain proposals, you should have built-in limitations that perfect, prevent attacks and encourage community participation. So, for example, long voting periods so that people have a time to watch and vote. Um, and I should say long voting periods in some cases because maybe you don't want it to be too long. You want to actually get something done sometime soon. Um, but especially time locks, you know, giving people a chance to, even once we've reached consensus on, you know, this decision and it's been approved, like having time to be able to at least, you know, let people respond to it. Maybe when you're upgrading another protocol that you've integrated with, you know, once they hear you've made a decision to upgrade, they look at the upgrade and they say, oh, no, this is actually going to affect us badly. Um, and then, you know, retain the ability to cancel that proposal, which can be done either by the proposer or maybe a privileged multisig or uh, other participants in the ecosystem. Um, you can minimize governance control as well. Uh, my classic example of this is uh, Tornado Cash. Tornado Cash has a DAO, um, but they couldn't do anything when the U.S. came through and sanctioned them because uh, they designed the system so that the DAO had zero control over any of the money or the pool. So they could both say, you know, we don't approve this criminal activity. We're not enabling it. We've just deployed a thing that they happen to be using, and we can't stop it. Um, and so from, you know, putting the ethical and legal arguments aside for what Tornado Cash is doing, like, from a pure engineering standpoint, they succeeded. And their governance didn't undermine uh, the security of their protocol uh, because they never gave themselves the ability to do so in the first place. Um, and in some cases, you might want upgradeability today, but maybe in the future you've reached a level of maturity where it's no longer needed, and you can burn that role and, you know, give people a guarantee the code won't change going forward. Um, just increase the cost of malicious voting attacks, make it hard for people to get enough token supply through a flash loan, other things like that. We actually do monitoring for Compound to watch for large borrows of comp to see if someone might be doing a governance attack. Um, and then finally, maintain checks on the coin voting power. Like, Optimism is actually pretty well known for like, trying to make like, a, uh, a two-house model, so both like, uh, token holders but also uh, community contributors uh, will actually like, have a share of the, the decision-making, so kind of like a bicameral DAO. Um, and then, yeah, overall, the on-chain process for passing and executing proposals should account for security impact of every possible decision, so consider limitations accordingly. Um, and then the ways that proposals are prepared, um, the way that they are audited and reviewed, uh, that's really important. So, like, at Open Zeppelin, we do a lot of work with compounds, so we're constantly trying to review the proposals to make sure there's no big security impact. Um, so doing a lot of quality assurance, doing testing, doing code reviews. There was actually an issue that came through Compound uh, earlier this month, and that primarily came through something that uh, hadn't been tested properly. Um, we did audit it. There was no problem in the code, but it was an integration problem. Um, there was an interface that was not accounted for in that, and basically that caused an issue um, that luckily was not severe and it, it could be fixed, but uh, you know, it could have been worse, and that's something that we're, we're kind of changing going forward is being much more uh, active in integration testing, you know, not just testing the code, but testing you know, what it's going to integrate with on, main, on mainnet, doing mainnet forks and then testing that locally uh, and other things that are more comprehensive. Avoid mocks as much as you can. Um, you know, documenting known security risks. So we, do, we documented a lot of known asset risks uh, in terms of listing tokens that might have, you know, infinite mint or, uh, you know, immediate upgrades, things like that. Um, monitoring on-chain activity. We use Forda and Defender, which are, um, you know, an open Zeppelin product and a, a decentralized protocol, uh, which can watch on-chain activ activity and alert if, for example, something on t compound upgrades and might cause an issue. Um, and then finally, uh, one thing I like is what ENS DAO is doing, which is they made an explicit constitution that says, we will never, ever take away someone's like ENS domain. Um, and that, the idea there is you can't, if it's upgradable, you can't technically build in code that will stop that, but you could build in community consensus to say we will never do that. And it's much harder to make a case for doing it, um, or at least it's very easy to see someone doing something that goes out of the bounds of that you know, constitution. So in general, take a DevSecOps approach, have a lot of testing and security reviews built into the pipeline for your proposal, just like you would for code going into production. Even if it's not making an upgrade change, it's good to simulate the proposal, make sure the effects are known, and uh, you know, avoid any issues from coming up after you've already passed it. Uh, and then finally, delegation of operational decisions. Uh, I'm gonna blow through this real quick, but basically what MakerDAO is doing, but also in, mo in a lot of different ways, delegating authority to operational units, delegating to multi-sigs, optimistic governance to allow unilateral decisions, um, and basically role-based access control. Like, don't just make it one DAO, one decision. You can delegate a lot. 
And all of this comes down to this sort of a system where basically you can have implicit protocol governance, immutable contracts, uh, a DAO, a multisig, and delegated units on top. And this is what it looks like for Compound. Um, and then finally, uh, by the way, this is an issue for layer twos because layer twos are upgradable, they have governance, and so if we're gonna solve the scalability trilemma, uh, we also have to solve scaling governance because that is why we're gonna govern the layer twos that are gonna make Ethereum scale. So uh, yeah, that's the talk, and I uh, hope to talk to y'all after.